time to call upon the session chair to take us through the uh, session two, which is about manufacturing and construction sector. We have Major General Melinda Pieris, RWP, RSP, VSV, USP, NDC, PSC, MPhil, Vice Chancellor, Kotalavla Defense University, joined the Sri Lanka Army as an office creditor, cadet in 1980, and he was commissioned into the uh, First Regiment Sri Lanka Armour Corps as the second lieutenant. Since then, he held vital and important appointments in the army with each rank held, and he reached the pinnacle of his military career in 2016 when he was appointed as the chief of staff of the Sri Lanka Army. He was the direct operations at the Joint Operations Headquarters and had been appointed as the Defense, Military, Naval, and Air Tashi for Sri Lanka in the U.S. Major General Melinda Pires commanded the uh, 2-2 Division in Trincomalee as the uh, General Officer commanding during the period of the liberation of the East by the Security Forces. On return from National Defense College in India, he was appointed as the Vice Chancellor of the General Sir John Kotalavala Defense University in December 2008. Ladies and gentlemen, to take us through the uh, session two, Please welcome Major General Melinda Pires. So I thank. Uh, the president uh, of ISS, ISMM, Mr. Sarat Gamage, and General Renu Kudwatta for inviting me to chair this session. It's an important uh, session to be chaired, and uh, without any further ado, as we have already uh, almost one hour behind the schedule, I will introduce the first uh, speaker to come in, uh, that is, uh, Dr. Tashika Gunasingha. Uh, let me formally welcome the first speaker, Dr. Mrs. Tashika Rupasingha, uh, General Manager of Data Science and Financial Analytics at Mass Capital Private Limited. Uh, Tashika, a former senior lecturer of the Department of Industrial Management and the founding director for the Center of Excellence for Strategic Brand Identity Development, University of Kalania, is a chartered member of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, CILT UK. She obtained her BSc Honours in Industrial Management from University of Kalania with a first class honours and winning a gold medal for the best student in the special degree programme. Tashika received her PhD and MSc degrees in Industrial Systems Engineering from uh, Clemson University in USA and won several awards for her teaching and scholarly work, including the Outstanding Teaching Assistant Award consecutively for four years, Best Research Award at the National Academy of Engineering USA in the Advanced Learning and Computation category, and the Best Research Award for Clemson Industrial Engineering. She has set a record at the Clemson University Department of Industrial Engineering for winning the greatest number of awards for teaching undergraduates. Upon completing her doctorate, she joined Cisco Corporation USA, overseeing master data optimization and analytics at the prestigious Vice Chancellor's Award at the University of Kalania in consecutive years of 2017, 18, and 19. She won the awards for outstanding research and leadership. She has won 23 international and national awards, including Digital Leadership Award at the FITIS 2021, 67 nationally scholarly publications, delivered speeches at 58 international conferences, 
and 420 plus Google Scholar citations covering supply chain management, optimization, and digital transformation. She is currently serving Mass Holdings as a general manager overseeing data analytics to unlock value. May I kindly call upon her to come and take the seat. Also, the second speaker, I will introduce him to the stage, uh, Engineer Major Ranjit Gunatilaka, the Managing Director and the General Manager of Sunken Construction Private Limited, will be our second speaker today. Mr. Ranjit Gunatilaka is an engineer, graduated from the Faculty of Engineering, University of Peradeniya in 1976 and qualified as a chartered engineer in 1979. He is a member of the Institute of Civil Engineers UK since 1979 and the Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka since 1984. He started his career in 1979 in Sri Lanka Army Engineers as an engineer in the volunteer force till 2007. For more than 30 years, and also served as a civil engineer in the State Development and Construction Corporation prior to joining the private sector. And also I know his contribution towards the Army as a structural engineer during the conflict period. Engineer Ranjit Guntilaka is currently the Managing Director of Sanken Construction and he had been with the company from its inception. Prior to the appointment as the Managing Director he was serving Sanken as the director and the Mitsui construction as the chief engineer since 1979. Also, engineer Ranjit Guntilaka holds the following positions in addition to the above. Ex-chairman of Major and Specialist Contractors Association of Sri Lanka, member of CEDA and ICTAD, now management board, president, chamber of construction, Industries, corporate member of the ISL Board of Registration representing the private sector, member of the Advisory Committee on Professional Service Sector of the Sri Lanka Export Development Board. May I kindly invite uh, Major Engineer Guntilaka, Ranjit Guntilaka to take the seat. <laughs> Very good afternoon, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank Major General Melinda Pierce for the uh, introduction, and of course for ISMM for uh, having us here. Thank you very much, and congratulations on your 50th anniversary. Okay, uh, so the topic that we are going to talk about uh, as the starting session for session two would be impact of industry 4.0 on supply chain performance. Um, I know after listening to the, uh, the first session, um, we already know Sri Lanka is far behind and we have lots of foundational things to uh, work on. That is a given fact, but that doesn't stop us from dreaming and thinking big and what is possible, right? So I don't want to sound like I'm trying to build a rocket here, right? Moment when you talk about industry 4.0, this is what it is, team, right? Whatever it is, it is technology, it's the digital transformation. We have to speak about it and know where we are and what we need to do to get there. Otherwise, again, after five years, maybe after 10 years, uh, myself or someone else, comes and stands uh, on this stage and say, Sri Lanka is way behind. We could have started long ago. So I don't think we should do that. We'll try to see maybe the little things that we can do from private sector, um, including the government sector. Having had the exposure in government sector in Sri Lanka, being a faculty member in the university and worked uh, there in US as a corporate person, as well as in uh, academia, and coming here, standing here, 
um, as, a, as a practitioner from MS Holdings, I think I've seen the world in different aspects. So I think we should, we should welcome the change. We should embrace the digital transformation, even though that we are not ready. Let's try to see the little steps that we can make. So that would be the, I would say, the starting point, starting uh, a remark that I want to make. All right, moving on. Uh, so in this uh, topic, everybody, I would like to break the entire topic into three segments, right? In simply, uh, what exactly is this? How do you embark on this journey? And what are those little steps that we want to make uh, in terms of becoming a digitally transformed supply chain? Okay, right? So the first point in terms of what exactly it is. I'm sure uh, you all would have heard about Industry 4.0, right? The fourth industrial revolution to etc. Many of the organization in Sri Lanka may not be ready to embark on the uh, Industry 4.0, but I can tell you from MAS as well as some of the, um, the, the corporate uh, companies that I have uh, worked with in Sri Lanka, we've actually started working on this about five years ago. Five years ago, for Sri Lanka and some of the companies. But if you just take the global arena, uh, we call these uh, companies as lighthouse factories. Lighthouse. I mean, just just take the word, right? Lighthouse, uh, giving the the guidance or the I would say the the trajectory when you're lost in the sea, just like that. So these lighthouse factories, the concept was actually uh, came about uh, about I would say about a decade ago, where uh, everyone knows about Alibaba, right? Can I see some hands up? Those who have not made, an, made a transaction using Alibaba? Right, I'm sure everyone has, right? So Alibaba launched its first lighthouse factory, the complete digitally transformed factory, two years ago, 2020. So for a company like that to launch its lighthouse factory, though the smart factory or the industry 4.0 enabled digitally transformed manufacturing entity. Two years ago, you can imagine when they would have started the planning, right? So we can, we can see we are not late even today if it probably ignites some uh, point in your minds to go back and see, uh, change the way we do things. I think uh, we are successful in that um, endeavor. Right, okay, so let me touch on the what piece first, and then go into the how, and then lastly, touch on the when. Defining the journey, the what. Um, I thought I would probably wanna show a small clip, which is only um, one minute. Uh, it's from KPMG, right? Let's take one minute and have a look at this clip. it is, isn't it? Right, I, I was so pleased to hear um, during the first session there were a couple of questions on digital transformation uh, about drones to etc. We can probably have a chat offline, right, on that. Um, so um, the entire industry 4.0, that is the fourth industrial revolution where a whole lot of things are being planned. So I've just put a couple of co components, right? So on a typical factory, we all know what we do, right? You know, uh, RM ordering to prep, 
to uh, manufacturing to etc but you see in a digital factory we have a digital twin of it what is a digital twin so you have the physical factory right you have the same physical factory recreated on a digital form so we call it a digital twin so by creating a digital twin what you're trying to do is so the data to etc no physically you are, you're seeing it right and it breaks it we crash and burn we do troubleshooting before it doesn't i mean before it happens can we recreate something before it goes bad you will be you will have that predictive intelligence through analytics to see how you can rectify the issues so that's that uh, the lens that we would use in terms of a digital twin so moving on as you can see i hope uh, i don't know whether you can see my cursor let me just get that right over here machine vision for predictive quality issue right so image processing artificial intelligence when you're making your product or service we extract the data real time we'll be able to see whether the the target parameters are off right so it alerts uh, things like that and then augmented reality um, using um, to assist training for workforce there's a whole lot of things i'm sure you would have heard about virtual reality like you know there's these headsets when you put those you can you can go into a different world kind of thing so training uh, development where even these SOPs, uh, standard operating uh, procedures, are not paper-based. You just put the headset and you can see, okay, there, there's hazards. This is the part that I have to follow. So that, that's the future factory, right? Um, touching on, I've already touched on the digital twin where the physical factory is already recreated on a digi digital platform. And then the digital uh, war room of dashboards. I'm sure from our old school, what we have is a paper base, right? So from the system, from your ERP to any of the digital, uh, like, you know, data capturing mechanisms, you print a report and you look at it. So when you print and look at it, it's all post-mortem. It has already happened. But what this tells is real time, can I see what's happening? And if there's a product being made out of quality tolerance, you stop it there. You don't catch it and then do in inspection. So that's that entire thinking, everyone. So that is to give you a, a bit on the, on what is this smart factory, right? So smart factory or the industry 4.0 has uh, key components, the foundational components. Starting from, it's the data and the connectivity. You got to have data first and then the data is connected and it's real time. So ask yourself, do you have the data? Uh, forget about the an, uh, digital form, at least in analog form do you have data? If someone asks from you, what's your uh, like, you know, profitability, what's your output, what's your defects, do you have the data? If you don't have it, you're far behind the game, right? So first you need to have the data and the data is connected. So that's number one. Then you have analytics and the intelligence using data only data will tell you what needs to be done. Of course, you can run it through, uh, like, you know, human intelligence, try to come up with, because not every time the data will tell you what needs to be done. There's this consensus, right? Human will also be part of that decision making. So, but you need to start with the facts. Then you have human machine interaction. So, this is not total automation, no? it's about automation, where you have the automation with the human touch. It is not to say that every factory that we have in Sri Lanka need to be 100% automated. No, it's not the case. What to pick, when to pick, what to automate. So that's a conscious decision that you have to make. And then you have the advanced engineering in terms of manufacturing. You can go into 3D printing to like, you know, all those advanced manufacturing techniques that you can enable as part of there. Okay. Moving on, now since you know about the industry 4.0, what's the implication for the supply chain, right? So on your left here, we have the traditional supply chain where it's very sequential, right? It's kind of a waterfall where you do something and then once it is done, it is passed on to etc. So what's that supply chain 4.0? 
what the industry 4.0 has revolutionized the way that we do supply chain. That's called a digital supply chain network. So here it's very sequential. You will see the, the, the nodes connected in a sequential or a linear fashion. But over here you will see it's a convoluted network. You see how many lines or the, the uh, these are the nodes, let's say. It is all connected. So this is um, everyone. The implications of industry 4.0 on our traditional supply chain. Right. I got this uh, image from McKinsey, right, one of the leading consultancy firms in the world. So when you just look at this, this actually this picture tells thousand words, right? Um, I just want you to have one second look on this picture and can someone tell me where should I start? Where should we start? So we have the performance, forecasting, factory, warehouse, customers, receiving stuff, and drones, right? Drones, um, and then, you know, digitally connected supply chain. In your supply chain, where would we start? Can someone tell me? Let's take a one second, maybe. A, a component. Maybe I'll start from factory, one would say. Or maybe I'll start from setting metrics or the performance indicators that we need to measure. Or someone would say, I would start from forecasting. Yes, sir. Forecasting. Good. Yes, miss. Yes. It's all connected, okay, very good. So I'm, I'm so glad that you looked at it and start thinking about it, okay? So what does supply chain 4.0 means to your supply chain? Why do we have to do this? Because it will give us resilient and responsive. So I know that these words being resilient, re responsive, agile, these are beaten to death, I would say, right? And if I ask from someone, person A, please define me, resilience, Blah, 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 right? Please define me agility, another set of definitions. What does it mean to you? You have to redefine. So in, I mean, as a, if I wear my academic hat, right? Resilience is you get broken, but you pick up and like the phoenix, right? So you rise up, that's resilience. Uh, agility, flexibility, responsiveness, like, you know, you should be able to scale down, scale up with limited resources too, etc. Like, you know, that's being agile, right? You are responsive to the change. And, okay, we've gone through that. Data-driven, I think one of the gentlemen over here uh, in the first session talked about data-driven. So I'm heading data analytics for MAs, right? So I started as an uh, industrial systems engineer, worked my way into, uh, like, you know, manufacturing, optimization, and then supply chain professional. Now I'm standing as a data scientist. So I cannot stress on the importance of having data first, right? And then how do you create insights? That's a different story. So, but in analytics, if it is data-driven, starting from descriptive world, the post-mortem to cognitive analytics, where you try to predict and, and say what is possible and driving it, that's the future more effective and efficient. I don't think we should even touch on that. It's pretty evident. Now, we, since we know what it is, the beast that we are trying to, you know, kind of get to know, we, we know what it is. Now, how do we go about it? These words, everyone, digitize, digitalize, digitally transform, that these words are also beaten to death, right? But do we actually know what it is? That would be the starting point. If I ask from someone in the audience, I see about 100 or 200 people. Can someone actually define what is digitize, digitalize, and digitally transform? Someone want to take a stab at it? All right. I would assume everyone knows, and we'll proceed, the three Ds. I'm sure you guys would have heard I don't speak Russian, so please, uh, uh, my apologies for mispronouncing this word. The matryoshka dolls, raise your hands, those who have these dolls at home. 
you know, there's a tiny one, and then the tiny one goes in another one all the way. So that's the best analogy that we can use for digital transformation. You've got to start small. If you don't start small, you can kiss goodbye the entire journey. So don't get bombarded or get, uh, I would say, nervous or an, um, anxious that we are not a digitally transformed organization. Start first by digitizing your data. Got to have it in some more form in digital, right? So you start from that. That's the digitization. Make the data digital. And then digitalization is, you look at the entire process. Each component, you might have to relook at it and see where it is. And then including the entire thing, including your, sorry, including your um, business model, when you try to look at from a digital lens. And then there's a whole lot of things since we don't have time. I'll not go into detail. You can become a digitally transformed company or an entity. So it could be a level one, level two. I've put some numbers down also so that you know because it's, it's very easy when you relate uh, it through a number, right? Oh, this company is at level two. Oh, this company is at level three, kind of. And then you know where it is through a maturity assessment. you got to know where you are, right? I mean, rather than just telling, okay, we have long way to go. We don't know where we are. So just let's try to see where we are now. If you just look at a typical supply chain, we can do a double click, right? So I know that it's a whole lot of information over here. If you do a double click, you'll see this one. When you do another click, you'll see this one. So every little component, when you do the double, the triple, the, the fourth click, you'll see where you are. And then you've got to do a digital maturity assessment. Where are we are? Do that gap analysis and you'll know where you want to go. And it's a phased uh, approach. Huh? You cannot transform your entire organization overnight to a, like an Amazon, Alibaba, um, I would say Microsoft, Facebook kind of entity, or even manufacturing, I would say, like, you know, uh, Unilever's, PepsiCo, Coca-Cola. So they have gone through this. They have gone through this. They have done their maturity assessment. They've understood what would be the roadmap for the next two years. And then after, IBM, classic example. So. In prioritizing this, McKinsey again, I really like this compass. This is again a lighthouse, huh? just like what I've spoke of. A lighthouse through McKinsey Digital Compass lets you identify these six drivers. Any supply chain, if you want to transform, you've got to start with what? What's the most important thing? I think we as a nation, what we lack also, a strategy. Strategy got to be there because you can have the most, I would say, sophisticated tools, the most qualified people, but if it is not strategically aligned, everyone, we are not going anywhere. So first, your corporate or your government strategy for your entity need to be in place. So this is how I gave these rankings, but McKinsey uh, generally gives um, all these like an equal weight. So I would say for Sri Lanka, it's one, two, one strategy. Performance management, what the heck are we trying to measure through that? Your current state, your future state. Then you know that whether you're achieving, isn't it? Right? What gets measured gets managed. I did not say that. Peter Drucker said. Right? So number two. Number three is planning. If you don't plan, I think we have enough examples from Sri Lanka there. We've got to plan and execute. And then, of course, order management. I ranked the physical, for, uh, uh, physical flow as five, but maybe in your uh, context, you may be able to, you know, kind of uh, prioritize this uh, more than five, number five, maybe three or so. And then, of course, collaboration. If you can't collaborate, we can't uh, succeed. So by doing all that, what you're trying to achieve for that supply chain 4.0 um, OS, you're trying to measure or uh, achieve this end state through service. Agility, capital, and cost. Those are the end entities. I thought that I would probably want to show you few of the use cases that I myself um, had uh, got the privilege to work with. Um, for Cisco, 
uh, like you know Cisco Corporation in US, the world's largest supply chain distributor. I was fortunate to work for them, heading master data and supply chain analytics. So you can see some of the tools that we have used. This is supply chain network optimization. Where are to set your next distribution center? Where are to route your um, like uh, transportation? Right, you know, tools are there. You don't have to like you know kind of have your own opinion. Right, data will like you can see right over there. Right, uh, the trucks, and this is okay. Here we go. Truck scheduling. Here it's a layout, uh, like uh, you know, how do you uh, move materials? You can do a sensitivity analysis. You can change the parameters. What if I take my layout to a different country? I change the layout from a S to L to O to you know different uh, uh, routing patterns. What would be that strategic op uh, operational? All that efficiencies can be. Uh, taken and inventory management, forecasting, predictive analytics, whole lot can be done, everyone. Right, so how do you start? The roadmaps. There's a whole lot of roadmaps in the literature. This is from McKinsey, this is from Gartner, I hope you guys have heard of it. Kep Gemini from MIT and along with the MIT Massachusetts Institute of Technology in US, then Deloitte, Accenture, and then IBM. Whole lot is there. We got to pick what is relevant for us. So do your gap analysis, look at this literature, come up with your roadmap. Last bit, since I'm out of time, when? How can I do this, right? So just do the product flow, everywhere it can be done. Pick and choose, pick and choose where you want to start. What is critical to your bottom line? What is critical for your sustainable glow? So the roadmap, you would have to detect, everyone, let me get my cursor. Detect, decide, and execute. If I do a quick double click, whole lot of tools are there, whole lot of tools. But start with your maturity gap analysis, know what is that strategic alignment, and then you can execute. What's next for Sri Lanka? I thought I could probably break this entire thing into three. There are foundational pillars, team. Foundation. If the foundation is not right, you can't build a rocket or the blue sky. So there, we can probably drill down. We, I can probably tell you all day long the foundational things got to do. Then, of course, enablers, one step ahead, enabling pillar. And then, of course, future proofing, that blue sky got to start. Maybe I would say the composition, 50% here, 30% here, 20% here. Something like that. So I would like to end my presentation with one of my favorite quotes from Tony Mayer from uh, Harvard Business School. Finding what's wrong and fixing it versus seeing what's possible and going for it gives two different perspectives. Ground level problem fixing versus seeing what's possible. It got to merge, it got to connect. There you create the synergy. So I ask ourselves, uh, us and everyone, are you ready to embark on the digital transformation to enhance and unlock value through supply chain? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tashika, for your very interesting and uh, informative uh, presentation. I'm sure you may have not many questions to ask so we'll uh, proceed with uh, Major Engineer Ranjit Guntilaka on his presentation. Good afternoon to all of you. Major General Mirinda Piris, Chairperson of this session. President of Institute of Supply, Sup, Supply uh, sorry, Institute of Management, Supply, and once again, I got the name, a bit confused, sorry for that. ISM, -M. <coughs> and the director board and the council of the institute. Distinguished 
guest, ladies and gentlemen. From morning, we heard many valuable speeches, and this is going to be the, probably the last before the lunch. So I can see your faces, very hungry faces, no smiles, but we'll go through not much of data on the board. Just please listen carefully what I say, and you may fire any questions uh, at the end of my speech. The last Friday, in the construction sector, we had a meeting in the president's office, chaired by the president, its excellency, the president, and <coughs> almost all the people of the construction sector, I mean leading people and government officials, and the few cabinet ministers, and most of the regulatory bodies, chairmen, including Central Bank, People's Bank, Bank of Ceylon, all that. Just to see what is going to happen for the construction industry for the next couple of years. We discussed in detail, and it's the same subject that I got to speak here, that is what will happen for the economy and the environment in the construction industry or the sector. I should say for all of you, don't worry. Nothing will happen for the next three years in the construction industry in this country. I am not negative or against any situation, but that's the reality. So ISM members should not worry whether the environment get disturbed or the economy get disturbed. Why I'm telling is, at the end of the meeting chaired by the president, being the past president of the chamber, I asked the president, the construction industry is taking about average 10% of the GDP, and for the next three years, I can't see anything will happen in the construction industry. Of course, 90% what is outside the industry, there could be so many things, and <coughs> this supply chain would, and your work will continue. But there will be indirect effects on other sectors also, because the construction industry is directly related to the national development. Because the construction industry itself when I say 10%, that is about $8 billion industry in this country's economy. And if you take it, the industry itself is 50% is all imported materials or other services which comes to the country. As Mrs. Shashi said, the country's main problem is dollars. That's correct. We talk in billions of dollars, but we can't get even $200, $300 when you go overseas just to spend, because that is also limited. So now, what we got to keep on talking, and it's a shame to talk about we don't have money, there's no construction, there is no industry, there's, there'll be so many taxes, everything, but how to recover this situation? So we have to, everybody, 
in this audience or outside or in the construction industry think. Yes, country declared bankruptcy, it's correct. The first affected party when I say, I think, is the construction sector. Because I know in the construction industry, so many people directly involved, the owners or the company directors are affected, and the bottom people who are the, you know, casual workers, also affected totally about one to one and a half million of this population and their families. So we have to, we are already made a lot of things, how we should review this situation and what best as people in industry we can do. The same time, what always we don't see is whether the others who are in the industry directly or indirectly attend into this. When I say others, because you know the construction industry, there's few, about 10 to 15 percent only, directly involved from the uh, government sector. About 85 percent, whether it's the consultants or the contractors or the other people involved, are in the private sector. But the total regulation, regulatory bodies are in the government sector. So how they are affected are not being addressed now. If you see whether it is the Construction Industry Development Authority or the other uh, state sector like Central Engineering Consultancy Bureau, State Engineering Corporation, UDA, RDA, Irrigation, all these places, there are thousands and thousands of architects, engineers, all the skilled people and technical people are involved and their life is that. But one got to understand once the construction industry becoming almost zero for the next three years, what will happen to these supporting and the regulatory bodies? This is very alarming and maybe that comes down to the most of you as members who are involved directly or indirectly for the various industries for the construction industry. My question from the president who are there in, I asked whether are you confirming for the next three years is this going to be the country's situation in the construction industry? He virtually accepted and he said, of course, for the next year, it's going to be minus around nine to 10 percent, uh, the development rating negative, and the following year will be predicted for also negative for four percent, and the, he didn't accept the three years, but he said next two years. This is where we all must think together how we are going to review the construction industry and it's coming to the economy. So how we should overcome this? What ISMM can do? And ISMM 50 years old, I congratulate them, their staff, but there are other institutes also much older than this, whether the Institute of Architects or Institute of Engineers, it's more than 100 years. One area where I personally see in the country, the main failure is, as you always say, interference by politicians, interference, interference by political organizations, I say as a professional, in all these things, the failure is professional negligence of this country by all professionals. And we try to pass the ball to others. This I told them. In fact, with the discussion, we said 
to appoint for the construction sector a special task force to how to get up from this situation. It's not now when the president was finance minister, prime minister, we raised it and he, was, he told one of the senior treasury members, they say, yes, sir, we'll do it next week. Then the following week, we got an opportunity. We said the same thing and not appointed. The last week, you all would have seen in the newspapers, if you have seen, the PMD, presidential, I mean, uh, media division, has published that they are going to appoint, but uh, I don't know. Because this is the most important thing. And I specifically said, don't appoint this task force only by the government officers. Get the industry people in. I think one of the speakers here spoke that they should, or the, uh, the prime minister himself spoke, get the proper value of private sector involved in these affairs, which is today, I think in our country, even if you go for a meeting to address even a round table or whatever, the conference table, on the front area is seated fully by government officers. And most important private sector people are put to the corner, or we don't have a place to even uh, sit. This we have addressed. Give us the proper opportunity, otherwise this country, we, we can talk a lot of theories, but we, we should address the uh, roots of the issues. It's a high time for us to identify and address it. So I, in my topic, I was telling that when I talked about, when we talked about here, we basically saw a lot of micro issues. But as a construction man, as the industry, I see the macro issues of these supplies. When I say macro issues of supply chain, I'm not going to talk about few materials of import or export or anything. You see, it, many construction projects today has become a headache for the country and failure because we have not addressed whether such supplies are relevant to this country or not. Now, if you know, I take few projects where we, I, I have involved. One is Umayo project, which is 450 million US dollars or 500 million US dollars. They need another about 10 million dollars but no one is talking about. But these projects, not one, <coughs> there are few, few more. And if you know that there is a, before any of these projects come into the picture, no one is doing proper feasibility study. I'm sorry to say that, but I'm taking, telling all this with a high degree of responsibility. I don't want to name one by one. But today, there are so many <coughs> government projects we have stopped. Not me, <coughs> by the government has stopped, no more capital expenditure. But some projects halfway stopped. Because if you have done the feasibility studies properly, they shouldn't have gone like that. So, but millions of the value of these projects halfway stopped means the millions of dollars that what we spend for those projects are ending up where? So, Mirinda, I don't know whether you agree. I don't know how much we plan for the defense headquarters. Just take it. Anyone is questioning about this? How much we have already spent? How much we have overspent? How much going to be spent? When you say construction, it is dollars. What you get in Sri Lanka is the only free component, what we can get it is the sand, what is flowing in the river. If you take it here, top to bottom, everything is imported. Buildings are like that. 
but irrigation is something different that we get return on our return on the uh, investment. So more and more this country needs that. So the members of Institute of <coughs> Supply and this uh, supply chain management, you go to think, please think of that, that side. You are very important people in the uh, industry and the country, please think of that. We are doing and stopped halfway few projects because of the dollar situation. And that is buried. You don't get any interest on that. But finally, the other day-to-day -day life of all of you are affected. And no one's talking about it. So there is another expressways we have started. And just stopped. LRT. So much of money spent, just stopped. So what I say, please think, instead of supply management more, that you have, you have to educate the people, not the materials or other components supplied, you've got to think of how the project are supplied to the country and educate the people. So with this, we end up with many issues and I try to get uh, as a construction chamber, how best that we can save the dollars in the future. And how best we can get this is into the relevant authorities. With uh, <coughs> ISMM, I think instead of engineers, instead of architects, and all these leading institutes can join, can have uh, seminars jointly to address this situation macroscopic. When, uh, when that is addressed, hope within the next three years our country will have a positive uh, positive grading and all the banks will be happy, the individual institutes will be happy, individuals will be happy to overcome and stop our professionals and our good uh, and efficient workers and the staff and the youth live in this country. So I thank again for ISM for giving this opportunity and thank you very much. Engineer Major Ranjit Guntilaka, sir, thank you for your insightful uh, presentation so that the audience, those who are involved in relevant areas, they could plan ahead. Of course, I think uh, it's time for us. Now, this situation is not only for Sri Lanka. This situation being experienced by many countries in the world, if I'm not mistaken, more than 53 countries. And uh, so there are uh, enough examples in the world, especially Iran, Pakistan, and when those countries, they face so much of embargoes and other financial issues, they started innovating their own stuff. They never stopped their activities. They, some or other today, Iran, they manufacture almost each and every uh, war material that they required by them without any support from any other Western countries. So here also we should think about a way forward. Uh, and uh, uh, now I invite uh, both the speakers and for you to ask uh, questions. Of course, I was told uh, limited to three questions due to paucity of uh, time. So if the, uh, so we'll restrict to three questions and then uh, uh, I'm not going to ask question because I have made almost two or more, but I thought I should, since it is three questions, uh, may, I will give you the opportunity. Yes, sir.
Good afternoon to everybody. My name is Aichi Pereira. Uh, question goes to Dr. Mrs. Tashika. So, digitization and digitalization, we see the rest of the world, especially the developed countries. Also countries like uh, Ethiopia are moving faster. Uh, Dr. Mrs. Tashika, what do you think, what is holding Sri Lanka going forward it was digitization and digitalization. And what is your advice on that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, so um, it's like this, like, you know, different countries will have uh, as part of their policy and strategic framework in terms of where they want to go, unfortunately. Um, I do not know whether the Sri Lankan government for the last five years or for the last decade, whether we had included that as part of our technological strategy, right? Where we would want to see Sri Lanka as a hub of something, something. So uh, what I've seen, um, in the recent past, I see the majority of the industrial partners, the corporate entities, have actually taken a greater stab at it, right? Coming from MAS, I would say. Um, so we started our digital journey about 10 years ago. So we've actually piloted our first smart factory. And we won uh, the, the FITI's award uh, last year for that, right? So many companies that I know from the corporate, I'll answer from the government and the national standpoint why we are like, you know, kind of held back. But um, industries are compelled to go because the partners, the suppliers, the customers are asking us to go for digital transformation. I'll tell you from pandemic standpoint, all our physical samples were stopped due to COVID, right? We, we, I mean, we are, I mean, I'm so proud to say that being in the apparel sector, we bring the majority of the forex to the country these days. So during the pandemic also, we were able to do it because we went fully digital for our fitting samples, all done through product development uh, tools, virtual. Right, you know, we, we fit the garment to a model digitally, we do the changes to all that. Since we've enabled that, we were able to proceed further. So I know for majority of the companies in the apparel world, we, we were compelled by the customers. So if we asked as a nation to ourselves, uh, what is holding us back? Uh, one of the things that I have seen is the resistance coming from the employees itself because they think this as something um, that will impact their job security. The digital tools are going to come and then they will take all our jobs. That's not the way to do it. So there's a lot of change management. Um, our HR partners need to look at. Even in the corporate sector, this is uh, looked as a threat not as an enabler to thrive. So we have to address that uh, job security issues. Then the second thing is change management. How are these job roles going to be changed when digital uh, tools are going to be? It's not like you know you will be doing the data entry, logging in uh, information to a paper to etc. But you will do much more, I would say, um, knowledge work content, and then we as a nation, we can thrive. So th those are two aspects that I would see from the people standpoint. And third thing is uh, the ROI. Every single time when we try to embark on a digital tool, the finance, I'm also part of finance, I can call uh, myself as a finance professional also, but we always try to look at the ROI. Okay, this is $2 million investment. What is the impact immediately it's gonna get in? So I think there are certain foundational things to be inbuilt. If someone asks Microsoft, like, you know, Word, Excel kind of a thing, if we bring in what's the ROI, it'll be not so very straightforward to say that, right? Uh, Word, Excel, like, you know, project management tool, if you bring in, it'll be tough to quantify the business impact. Certain things need to be there to strengthen the foundation. So I would say looking at not just the financial benefit, establishing the foundation and then embarking on it would also um, expedite our journey. And I must also say, a lot of universities in Sri Lankan universities, IT sector, the students are available, right? If you have a project, I'm sure we can get those in, uh, like, you know, students as interns to support you. It doesn't involve always dollars, okay? So there's small steps if you really want to do it. That we, if there's a will, there's a way. So people, 
change management, and then the ROI is holding us back, but uh, far most the strategy, I would say. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Tashika. Next question from there, somebody asked. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, Dr. Tashika, thank you very much for a very insightful presentation. And I think uh, in this forum, we have to find some solutions. So what I feel is like we were talking about dollar crisis and we said we have to stop dollars going out and we have employment issues, thumping shipping costs, all these things. So why do you think like uh, 3D printing as a solution to this? Because we are talking all this for several years, but we are not implementing, only few people. And the, so why don't we encourage our entrepreneurs in SEMIs to give this uh, technology 3D printing so that you can avoid dollars going out. At the same time, you don't have to waste time uh, and people will get jobs, all these things. So is there anything we can do to start this and go get it going? Thank you very much. Miss, what's your name? I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. I'm Chapa. Chapa, thank you very much for that question. I, I really appreciate the positivism, right? We already know, like, you know, where we are going from. So putting a smile to our face and see what exactly we can do. So one thing that I could tell you in terms of um, uh, expediting this approach, it's the awareness, communication, right? I think even in the previous um, session, uh, someone asked the question, we have enough importers, right? So who's doing, uh, we have to encourage them to export. And then looking at Bangalore, the near, like, you know, our, like our neighbor, you can see in terms of, uh, like, you know, the world's biggest outsourcing destination, right? And then let's take software, for example. What do you need to uh, develop a software, right? I hope there's enough uh, software professionals here. You don't have to have a lot of investment. There's no physical assets required. You need the skill. Right? So I would say um, improving the skill, uh, spreading the awareness that these are the new opportunities would be the way to go, Ms. Chapa. And then collaborating with the universities. I cannot stress more, University of Morotua, uh, UCSC Colombo, uh, School of Computing, Colombo, Japura, University of California, all that. We have started lots of programs and there are brilliant students Right? So partner up with them. If you have a project, please reach out to the local, not just the local universities, even the private universities. There are enough skill set there in the universities. Try to see whether we can, we can give them a project and try to you know, kind of um, uh, work on leverage on these incubation centers. Right? Setting up those incubation centers, we already have few. I can probably talk to you in terms of that. And then this industrial transformation. One aspect is this uh, technology, where the 3D printing, so there's a whole lot of things out there. So starting a basic BI tool, business intelligence, visualization, start monitoring what you have, then you'll see the gaps. And maybe it'll end up in 3D printing world or something else, we don't know. So do your gap analysis, the maturity assessment, and we will, we'll, please reach out to individuals like us. We can definitely uh, connect you with the relevant parties. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Dashika. Last question. Uh, I am Nandana, uh, one of the ISM member. Uh, my question is goes to uh, Dr. Tashika. So we all agree with the digitization. And uh, my uh, thinking is a little bit different because we need uh, uh, infrastructure for digitization. So then I see that we are, as a nation, again going for a trap and going to be more vulnerable in future if we are not have the ownership for this infrastructure. Example for software and also for the uh, what do you call digital platforms all and the devices all are belongs to the multinationals and to the developed nations so how is that correct i mean i'm asking whether sure. it is uh, sure. uh, uh, correct you know whether we are going in, in after a couple of decades people will criticize us that we again in a trap you know 
in 1707, uh, we opened the economy, then we were not reluctant to change. Now we changed and get the different experience for a couple of decades, and we were thinking that we were successful. So what will happen in the digitization? Thank you for that question. I think um, that is one of the biggest, I would say, challenges that we have. But I want to tell you, not there are bigger comp like you know players microsoft to all that right we have to play, play royalty but other than proprietary platforms there are enough tools out there called open source right you look at all the developing countries i myself wrote a book on r right r uh, is one of the most widely used statistics and computation platform hope you guys have heard linux python Right? Open source. There's enough platforms and tools available for developing countries to leverage on. That's again, uh, like, you know, coming back to what Ms. Cha asked, it's the awareness. You just have to look at, not just by looking at, oh my God, it's even the Forex will go to the Western countries too. I mean, there, there's, there are some tools, right? Because, but underneath, if you crack those tools also, majority also build on open source. Right? So we have a way to go. We have enough tools. It is not just starting the big cake. Let's start small. Identify your critical processes. It may be a small program that you have to write through collaborate, collaborating with universities. And then there are enough, uh, I would say, entrepreneurial Sri Lankan companies, if you can just maybe sign up for Slascom, right? Um, Sri Lanka, I can't remember the acronym, I'm sorry. Slascom, there are enough Sri Lankan software developing companies will be able to help you. And then along with open source technologies, I think we can um, face that battle. Not totally, I would say 50% we can solve that problem. Hope I answered your question. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Thashika Rupasingha and major engineer Ranjit uh, Guntilaka for their insightful, very informative, and interesting uh, presentations that they have done. What we need to finally think is be patriotic and think about the country's situation and find solutions. Always, if you try, you will find solution. There is no question or problem that there is no solution. There is a way forward always. So we'll think optimistically and try to find solutions and get out of this crisis that we face now. You all are responsible as uh, in the morning, uh, uh, Prime Minister said uh, that he appreciated the efforts taken by the private sector companies and you all team up together and find solutions so that we can develop our country within the next two to three years. We can get out of this issue definitely uh, within the next couple of years. And as uh, Dr. Tashika also said, there are so many universities, including KDU. We are uh, having so much of partnerships with uh, companies, including Mars. And uh, we do a lot of activity. So you tap the universities and work with them and find solutions. And thank you so much. And we conclude the session now. Thank you very much. Can we have the president of ISMM, Mr. Sarat Gamage, along with the past president, Mr. V. Ganesh, past president, Mr. Danish Pereira, vice president, Mr. Dimuka Hemanta, over here, please, gentlemen, as we are ready to present some special tokens of appreciation. First token of appreciation being presented to, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Tashika Rupasinghe, general manager, data science and financial analytics, MAS Capital Private Limited. Everyone give it for Dr. Tashika Rupa Singh. Thank you very much. And next we have, ladies and gentlemen, Engineer Major Ranjit Guratilaka, Retired Managing Director, Sunken Construction Private Limited, being presented with yet another token of appreciation. Ladies and gentlemen, please give for Engineer Major Ranjit Gunatilaka, Managing Director, Sanket Construction Private Limited. And one final token of appreciation for this session 
to the uh, session chair, Major General Melind Pieris, Vice Chancellor, General Sir John Kotalavala Defence University. Ladies and gentlemen, the session chair, Major General Melind Pieris. So thank you very much.